the symptoms and you can see them, then you don't have to worry about catching them. Yet this guy picked up the disease, apparently from somebody who did not have the infectious symptoms. Uh, again, don't hypothesize because we just don't know. So we have no idea what he did or didn't do uh, and how he got it. Um, I'm sure that's going to be vital information to try to understand the transmission. But the idea that there's going to be a widespread outbreak here, I think, is just, again, it's a bit of uh, fear-mongering. We have a single case. This is not a uh, big Yeah, yeah, but I'm just widespread. getting back to the president's statement, doctor, and that is that the president said it would be unlikely if we had a case in this country. Unlikely to have even one case. Can I get back to see the tape again? Uh, he said it, it wouldn't be a Ebola outbreak, and I think that's No, and in the second accurate. part of his sentence, he said that in the yeah. unlikely case, someone brings it here. Yeah. In the unlikely case, somebody brings it here. Well, they've done it. We're living in the world of the unlikely already. That's all I'm saying. I'm not spearmining. I'm explaining the facts, and I wonder right, if everybody Chris, else is. You're right. In today's video, we investigate the truth about the deadly Ebola virus and ask critical questions about the outbreak. The first case in America was confirmed just a few days ago at a Dallas, Texas hospital. And according to reports, a second person is already being monitored who came in close contact with the first. Another report indicated that an Ebola infection was possible in the state of Hawaii, another in Washington, D.C. And now, according to multiple sources, up to 100 more people are being monitored for Ebola in Dallas where the original outbreak occurred with an incubation period of roughly 2 to 21 days and an infection rate doubling every 15 to 20 in countries like Liberia, according to the CDC. It is anyone's guess how many more people will be infected by the time you watch this video. Before we get started, please support our sponsor, ProPureUSA.com. ProPure is the number one gravity-fed water system on the market today, period. Don't waste your hard-earned money on bottled water. Save hundreds of dollars a month with the ProPure water filtration system and enjoy clean, crisp, refreshing water. Click the link below right now. The Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, and the President of the United States all assure us that the deadly Ebola virus will be stopped, contained, and quarantined. But what if it's not? What if they're wrong? And what if the disease continues to spread? I'd like to emphasize that our intent isn't to scare you with this video, but to provide you with key information and ask critical questions of the outbreak. For example, how is the Ebola response currently being handled by our government and health agencies? Is the response adequate? Have authorities prepared for a worst case scenario? And are safeguards properly in place? Can we be confident that if a worst case scenario does occur, we are prepared for it? Please note that in a time of crisis, we can expect our government, public officials, and media to be less than transparent. It is why we, the alternative media, must ask critical questions and question the official narrative. We must investigate all possibilities and keep our minds open. Our very lives may depend on it. We sincerely hope that this horrific disease is contained and that our government is telling us the truth. But as was the basis for the founding of this great nation, we the people must question our leadership and have a healthy distrust of our government. After all, what is in the best interest of rulers and kings isn't always in the best interest of the people. For example, if President Barack Obama already knew that an aggressive outbreak was about to take place in America and that the virus was spreading rapidly, would he tell you about it? Or would it be in the best interest of our government and the political elite to keep their mouth shut? Wouldn't they want to prevent panic? Two weeks ago, the president said this. I thank Dr. Frieden and everybody here at the Center for Disease Control for welcoming me here today. Uh, Tom and his team just gave me an update on the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Our efforts to help mobilize the international community to fight it and the steps that we're taking uh, to keep uh, people here at home safe. Tom and his team are doing outstanding work between the specialists they have on the ground in West Africa and here at headquarters, uh, they've got hundreds of professionals who are working tirelessly on this issue. This is the largest international response in the history of the CDC. First and foremost, I want the American people to know that our experts here at the CDC and across our government agree that the chances of an Ebola outbreak here in the United States are extremely low. We've been taking the necessary precautions, including working with countries in West Africa to increase screening at airports so that someone with the virus doesn't get on a plane for the United States. In the unlikely event that someone with Ebola does reach our shores, we've taken new measures so that we're prepared here at home. We're working to help flight crews identify people who are sick and more labs across our country 
now have the capacity to quickly test for the virus. We're working with hospitals uh, to make sure that they are prepared and to ensure that our doctors, our nurses, and our medical staff are trained, are ready, and are able to deal with uh, a possible case safely. Interesting. Just a few weeks after the unlikely event, the CDC confirmed we now have our first infection. Today, we are providing the information that an individual traveling from Liberia has been diagnosed with Ebola in the United States. This individual left Liberia on the 19th of September, arrived in the U.S. on the 20th of September, had no symptoms when departing Liberia or entering this country, but four or five days later, around the 24th of September, began to develop symptoms. On the 26th of September, initially sought care, and Sunday, the 28th of September, was admitted to a hospital in Texas and placed on isolation. Hundreds of people are now being closely monitored by the CDC for the disease, and the potential scope of the outbreak is pushing beyond the state of Texas. Does this mean that the unlikely event the president was talking about is now likely? And what necessary precautions is he taking? AMTV reported last week that the president had authorized up to 3,000 U.S. troops to be deployed to Monrovia, Liberia, at the heart of the outbreak in West Africa. In addition to deployment of U.S. troops, by the way, with no experience handling or quarantining infectious disease, I guess they're just going to shoot at the virus, up to a half a billion taxpayer dollars were allocated. Is it not obvious that this is a very aggressive action and allocation of valuable resources? Does it suggest that the spread of Ebola is a much more serious threat than they are leading us to believe? Curiously, the president is also using this as an opportunity to install strategic military bases in the region, AFRICOM, at the same time he is bombing Iraq and Syria illegally through executive action. But this we will save for another video. Judging by the seriousness of the president's actions, his military deployment, we can be rest assured that the president has already taken the logical step of stopping all incoming air traffic from Ebola-affected nations, like Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Nigeria, where the disease originated. Right? Wrong. As of the production of this video, and pointed out months ago by AMTV, not only has the president not stopped incoming air travel from this part of the world, but this is exactly how the recent infection in Dallas was transported to America. By air. So why would the president overlook this? Is this not a necessary precaution we should be taking? Why would Homeland Security not provide security to the homeland to prevent the spread of a deadly infectious disease that could turn into a pandemic here in America and potentially kill millions? Either this proves malicious intent to infect Americans at home, or at the very least, it's gross negligence. Hopefully by the time this video airs, the president will have done the right thing and halted all incoming air traffic from the Ebola hot zone. If he doesn't, this is a serious red flag. So as a production of this video, Ebola air travel is still wide open into America. Our border defenses, useless, vulnerable to the spread of a virulent and deadly infectious disease. Thomas Eric Duncan, a Liberian national and the first known infected patient to have brought the disease to America, flew from Liberia to a connecting flight in Belgium and then all the way to Dulles International Airport before arriving in Dallas. He exposed himself to hundreds of people through recirculated air during these flights, not to mention airport terminals, bypass U.S. custom officials and Homeland Security. He later went to a local Dallas hospital to seek treatment, was overlooked by medical professionals on his first visit, and sent home with antibiotics, even though it was mentioned he had just traveled from an Ebola-infected country and wasn't isolated until a second visit at the urging of a close friend. So I have a question for you. How many more Thomas Duncans are there that we don't know about? And why has the president still not shut down incoming air traffic from Ebola-affected countries? Why is Obama recklessly playing with American lives? Is he trying to spread the disease? The Ebola response by the president, his necessary precautions, have not just been inadequate, they've been downright deplorable and arguably criminally negligent. Again, if the president doesn't shut down incoming air traffic soon, he's endangering millions of American lives. The American public should hold him accountable for this. Is there a motive for the president to voluntarily keep our borders open to Ebola? Who profits from an Ebola outbreak and what is there to gain in the unlikely event of a pandemic? As I mentioned on Twitter, for those of you that want a hint to the why of the Ebola outbreak, watch Revolution Season 2, Episode 12 on Netflix. Although fiction, this particular episode provides clues to how a government may use the threat of an engineered viral outbreak in order to cull the general population. Culling in biology is known as the process of segregating organisms from a group according to a desired or undesired trait. 
it is the process of separating animals, or humans, based on specific criteria in order to reinforce or exaggerate desirable traits and specifically get rid of the undesirable. Isn't it interesting that the first Ebola outbreak to infect an American on American soil just happens to occur in the great liberty state of Texas, a state grossly opposed to the Obama administration and his policies? Is it not also curious that the president currently planning executive action on illegal immigration, what some have called unilateral amnesty to terrorists, still has the border wide open to illegal aliens in the American Southwest? We hate to be so cynical, but it's almost as if the president is maliciously trying to wipe out undesirables, starting in the state of Texas. Could this be a form of Obama social engineering? A calling of the Patriot Movement. Now, before you criticize my reference to a fictional TV series, please be reminded that Mark Twain was famous for observing that truth is stranger than fiction. Although a tremendous amount of information is readily available to the general public thanks to the internet, most are still blindly unaware that the eugenics movement, something often linked to Hitler, was already well established in the United States before it spread to Nazi Germany. California eugenicists, for example, began producing literature promoting eugenics and sterilization and sending it overseas to German scientists well before the outbreak of World War II. By 1933, California had subjected more people to forceful sterilization than all other U.S. states combined. The Rockefeller Foundation helped develop and fund various eugenics programs, including the one that Joseph Mengele worked in before he went to Auschwitz. Upon returning from Germany in 1934, where more than 5,000 people per month were being forcibly sterilized, the California eugenics leader, C. M. Goethe, bragged to a colleague, quote, you will be interested to know that your work has played a powerful part in shaping the opinions of the group of intellectuals who are behind Hitler in this epic-making program. Everywhere I sense that their opinions have been tremendously stimulated by American thought. I want you, my dear friend, to carry this thought with you for the rest of your life, that you have really jolted into action a great government of 60 million people. Is Ebola a modern-day calling of the African population? Are social elitists like the Rockefellers getting rid of what they deem undesirables in our society? Could Ebola be a man-made disease? That's what one man, an American professor at Delaware University, Dr. Cyril Broderick, a Liberian native, thinks. In his controversial September 9th article, Ebola AIDS Manufactured by Western Pharmaceuticals, USDOD, Broderick accuses the U.S. government of engineering the Ebola virus and bringing the disease to Africa to infect the indigenous populations. What many have written off as conspiracy theory was credible enough for a major Liberian newspaper, the largest in fact, to publish it on the front page. The story, published by the Liberian Daily Observer, specifically implicates the U.S. government, Department of Defense, American research universities, in participating in an American military medical industry Cold War scheme to test bioweapons in African nations. Broderick suggests that the U.S. Department of Defense has been funding Ebola trials on humans, trials which started just weeks before the outbreak in Guinea and Sierra Leone occurred. The report claims that the DOD gave a contract worth $140 million to Tecmira, a Canadian pharmaceutical company to conduct Ebola research. This research work involved injecting and infusing healthy humans with the deadly Ebola virus. Is Dr. Broderick onto something? What other events in history bear witness to such a gross accusation? In a national security memo dated April 24, 1974, titled Implications of Worldwide Population Growth for U.S. Security and Overseas Interests, Henry Kissinger, the Secretary of the State and the administrations of Presidents Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford wrote, quote, depopulation should be the highest priority of foreign policy towards the third world. Depopulation, to depopulate something means to ravage, to ruin, to reduce the population of, especially by violence, disease, etc. Mr. Kissinger then continued, the United States economy will require large and increasing amounts of minerals from abroad, especially from less developed countries. This means they are going to destroy the population of mainly third world countries. The basic thesis of this declassified security memo is that population growth, especially in less developed countries, like in Africa, is a threat to U.S. national security. The threat of unmitigated population growth in these areas would lead to civil unrest and political instabilities. The paper continues, wherever a lessening of population pressures through reduced birth rates can increase the prospects for such stability, population policy becomes relevant to resource supplies and the economic interests of the United States. The location of known reserves of higher grade ores of most minerals favors increasing dependence of all industrialized regions on imports from less developed countries. The real problems of minerals 
supply lies not in basic physical sufficiency, but in the politico-economic issues of access, terms for exploration and exploitation, and division of the benefits among producers, consumers, and host country governments. Are Ebola-affected nations in West Africa host countries for valuable resources? Would the U.S. government implement policies that enhanced its interest in the political, economic, and social stability of these populations? In a policy paper published in 2000, Rebuilding America's Defenses, Strategy, Forces, and Resources for a New Century, it states that the art of warfare will be vastly different than it is today. Combat likely will take place in new dimensions. Advanced forms of biological warfare that can target specific genotypes may transform biological warfare, these weapons, from the realm of terror to a politically useful tool. Is the spread of Ebola politically useful? Another case, known as the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, was an infamous clinical study con conducted between 1932 and 1972, where the U.S. Public Health Service knowingly infected hundreds of impoverished rural African American men with syphilis and left others untreated. The men thought they were receiving free health care, but instead were being used as guinea pigs to study the natural progression of the disease. Over 600 test subjects were enrolled in the study, 201 of them who did not have syphilis when the study started. The 40-year Tuskegee experiment knowingly failed to treat patients with syphilis and infected others without their knowledge even after the 1940s validated penicillin as an effective treatment for the disease. According to the CDC, the men were told they were being treated for bad blood, while at the same time they were being infected with syphilis by the U.S. government. They were offered free food, medical care, and even burial insurance for participating in the study. It wasn't until a whistleblower that major changes occurred in U.S. law and regulation on protection of participants in clinical studies such as these. Is it possible that the spread of Ebola is another Tuskegee experiment? AMTV pointed out several weeks ago that the CDC just happens to own the patent on Ebola and up to 70% of its mutated strains. The patent, Human Ebola Virus Species and Compositions and Methods Thereof, CA2741523A1, puts the CDC in the unique position of profiting in the billions if an Ebola outbreak worsens. In the deposit statement it reads, the invention provides the isolated human Ebola, H Ebola viruses denoted as Bundi Bugyo Ebobun, deposited with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, United States of America on November 26, 2007. On the background of the invention, it states, quote, the family Filoviridae consists of two genera, Marburg virus and Ebola virus, which have likely evolved from a common ancestor. The genus Ebola virus includes four species, Zaire, Sudan, Reston, and Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast Ebola viruses, which have, with the exception of Reston and Cote d'Ivoire, Ebola virus been associated with large hemorrhagic fever outbreaks in Africa with high case fatality rates anywhere between 53% and 90%. Should we be skeptical of a government agency that stands to profit in the billions of dollars if an Ebola outbreak worsens? Who else stands to profit in a worst case scenario? Interestingly, the stock of a Canadian pharmaceutical company named Tecmira has since skyrocketed on news of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. The giant spike in its shares coincided with the FDA's recent announcement that the agency would loosen its hold on the development of Tecmira's experimental Ebola drug. In September, health professionals announced in a press release, that they would begin clinical trials in affected nations to fight the disease, sending the stock soaring. On July 9th, Tecmira Pharmaceuticals in Canada announced it received an initial $1.5 million investment from America's Monsanto, with tens of millions more to follow. The company's press release explains that the partnership is related to Tecmira's patented agropharma products, in other words, drugs for plants. Now, Monsanto is the largest agricultural seed supplier in the world. The company has also become one of the most hated over its genetically modified food products, GMOs, and the unethical methods the multinational corporation uses. While the monsanto Tecmira partnership has no known connection to the current Ebola epidemic, the Canadian pharmaceutical company's deal with the U.S. Department of Defense is specifically for Ebola. A second press release two weeks ago from Tecmira Pharmaceuticals announced the deal with the Pentagon. The U.S. military is paying the company $140 million to test drug treatments for Ebola. The announcement describes how the study is still in its infancy, testing low doses of drugs on healthy subjects to see how high the doses can get before the body has adverse reactions. 
AMTV suspects one of the main reasons infected Ebola patients have been transferred back to the United States for treatment, potentially infecting countless more people, is to study the effects of an Ebola vaccine in a controlled medical environment. African hospitals do not provide this setting, but Atlanta's Emory University Hospital, where the patients have been transferred, provides perfect conditions. At least two patients have already been transferred to this location, and Atlanta, of course, is the home to the Centers for Disease Control, also likely not a coincidence. If the CDC owns the patent on Ebola and stands to profit immensely from it, do these carriers not carry with them valuable intellectual property? One blogger notes, the most fascinating aspect of the Ebola vaccine manufacturing process is how quickly they have brought it to the clinical trials phase. It is virtually impossible for vaccine manufacturers to produce and deliver these drugs in the timeline they have proposed. It typically takes several years from the point of initial vaccine development to human clinical trials, a process which the manufacturers claim is being done in weeks and months. The only way it would have been possible was through years of planning and procurement. The trouble with the spread of Ebola is that its symptoms mimic the flu virus. According to the World Health Organization, a sudden onset of fever, intense weakness, muscle pain, headache, and sore throat are typical early warning signs. How is one to know if they've been infected by Ebola until it's too late? The CDC has emphasized that Ebola cannot be transferred through the air, and it's not an airborne transmittable disease. But can we be so sure of this? WHO states officially on its website that Ebola infection occurs from direct contact through broken skin or mucous membranes with the blood or other bodily fluids or secretions, stool, urine, saliva, semen of infected carriers. Infection can also occur if broken skin or mucous membranes of a healthy person come into contact with environments that have been contaminated with an Ebola patient's infectious fluids, such as soiled clothing, bed linen, or used needles. Skeptics believe that authorities are being less than transparent regarding the possibility of the disease mutating into an airborne strain. Now remember, when the outbreak first occurred several months ago, the CDC assured us that the infection rate would be limited to just a few thousand people before containment. But now, the same federal agency is warning that Ebola infections could total upwards of 1.4 million people in Africa alone by the end of January 2015. With a margin of error so large, how can we be sure that they're not also wrong about the threat of airborne transmission? A little research on the subject will show that Ebola may in fact be airborne already. Studies in Canada showing that airborne transmission is possible from pigs to monkeys without any direct contact between them. Pigs and monkeys were placed in separate cages during a 2012 study and contracted the disease. This is impossible unless the disease was transferred through the air. One scientist involved with the study, Dr. Gary Kobinger, from the National Microbiology Laboratory and the Health Agency of Canada suggested that the Ebola virus appeared to be spreading through the air. He noted, quote, what we suspect is happening is large droplets. They can stay in the air, but not long. They don't go far, he explained. But they can be absorbed in the airway, and this is how the infection starts. And this is what we think, because we saw a lot of evidence in the lungs of the non-human primates, that the virus got in that way." End quote. There is some debate as to what officially defines an airborne disease or not, whether droplets technically qualifies as airborne, but this is really just semantics. And do we really have time to debate semantics? The official definition in medical terms of an airborne disease is a virus that has the ability to stay alive without a liquid carrier. This sounds simple enough. Bottom line, these studies prove Ebola can be transferred and infect others through the air, whether it's through droplets or non-liquid form. If Ebola is airborne, according to studies in transmission from pigs to monkeys that had no direct contact with one another held in separate cages, why couldn't it also be transmitted this way to humans? Alarmingly, the CDC has now admitted this, suggesting that casual contact can, with infected patients, transfer the virus, meaning it can travel through the air, and that being within approximately three feet or within the room or care area for a prolonged period of time with an infected patient, not wearing recommended personal protective equipment, or having direct brief contact with them could spread the disease. Although obtuse in its explanation and a bit deceptive, the bottom line is clear. Ebola is very likely airborne. The UN is now warning that a nightmare scenario may be unfolding and that the Ebola virus could in fact be airborne already and spreading at an unprecedented rate. The CDC has also warned that in order to properly quarantine the virus and stop it from spreading, at least 70% of cases must be quarantined immediately in order for the disease to burn itself out. According to CDC Director Tom Frieden, only then would the outbreak reach a tipping point and the infection rate likely decline. Is this realistic? 
I can't help but think that a 70% quarantine of infections is unrealistic even in medically sophisticated countries like the United States and Europe, let alone Sub-Saharan Africa. Now let's pause for a moment and review the facts. How did we go from repeated assurances of total containment and quarantine just a few months ago? Reminders from the President, WHO, and the CDC that the Ebola virus was an unlikely event and controllable to a rapid shift and in increased likelihood that the virus could result in a full-blown pandemic. I mean, seriously, the UN chief is now warning that the disease could be airborne. Again, in no way is this video meant to spread fear or prevent those tragically infected by the disease from receiving immediate medical treatment. But as journalists and concerned citizens, we must acknowledge that as usual, we are not getting all the information being pitched half-truce by the media, and maybe even bold-faced lies from our political leadership. An event Obama once called unlikely is now as likely and fatal as the Ebola virus itself. And what we do next could be the difference between containment and a more aggressive outbreak. To help hold those in political power accountable, please like and share this video with everyone you know. For updates and more videos like these, subscribe to us on YouTube. Transcript, link, and sources will be attached to this video, and also on our website at amtvmedia.com. I'm Christopher Green, make it viral, hard hitting, and in your face.